I'm so excited to hear. Joey, you cheered the loudest. Thank you. So I married him for his loud mouth and his encouragement. Okay, how many of you loved coming in the door to our sweet, friendly greeters that hug you and wave at you and give you high fives? Yes, yes, yes. How many of you love the warm coffee that we have available? How many of you love dropping your children off and ignoring them for an hour and a half? Listen, David Fish mentioned it just a moment ago, but our church is growing exponentially faster than we had expected, which is a move of God. And that means that the church body that is here getting fed every week gets to pour back into the church body. So I'm gonna challenge you to grab your phone, put it in camera mode and hold it up to this QR code on the screen. We are in desperate need of partners in ministry. There are 45 spots that need to be fit or filled in kids ministry before Easter before Easter. If you know the numbers that we get here at Easter, you know that that's a low estimate of how many people we need in that area. I know I need at least 20 people in first impressions, and that's not all. There's so many spaces to partner with us at New River, and I want you to be able to invest back into the body that gives so much to you. And I want you to know that not every spot in kids ministry is teaching. Sometimes we just need the person that can walk child from classroom to the potty and back to the classroom. Like we can all do that, right? So let's play a part. Make sure you fill out that serve form. You might not know where you wanna serve. Fill it out and just say, hey, tell me about it. Give me some more information. I'd like to know, I'd like to help. I'm really excited for us to see what God has in the future for New River. So as uh, I said earlier, I'm married to Joey, the guy in charge here. So he and I co-lead the church. My official title is Pastor of Adult Ministry. I oversee Connect Groups and First Impressions. I'm a mom of three. I have a son, Tristan, who's 14. My daughter, Reese, is 11. And Reagan is almost three this month, which has gone so fast. But today we're going to dig into what God wants to tell us about John the Baptist. So I'm gonna have everyone open their Bibles, pull open their Bible app or Church Center app, follow on the screen behind me. We're gonna look at John 3, 22 through 30. If you'll stand for the reading of God's word, that's John 3, 22 through 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John was also baptizing at Anon near Salem Salem, because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you at the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. And in verse 30, he says, he must become greater and I must become less. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the words that you've given us in the Bible that inspire us to change our ways, to connect with you deeply to experience you maybe in a new way. So today I pray that your words would seep deep into our bones and preach a message that only the Holy Spirit can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So the world around us currently in this scenario of what we face around us is telling us that we should be really important. That you and I should share every opinion we have should receive every award there is to give, should receive all the accolades and all the attention, and everyone should honor us and hear our truth. The world tells us that we should be chasing fame and fortune, not just a little bit of fortune, but a lot. And not just a lot of followers, but like thousands and millions of followers. We want to go viral. We want to make a name for ourselves. We're told to get it while we can and, and to make a platform for ourselves and to turn every opportunity into a way to network or, or get what we need or get what we can. Saying with a, the same company that you've signed on to as a, a young adult 
for the next 40 years is a thing of the past. There's no concept now that's loyalty to a company or an organization. We go to those places and say, well, what can you give me? How can you pay me more money? How can you, boss, acknowledge me every day for all the hard things I have to do? And if you don't get those things, if you don't get the acknowledgement, if someone doesn't point out the hard things that you're doing, you go somewhere else that will give you more attention and more accolades and more appreciation. And the thing that disturbs me the most is that this mentality this heartfelt need to be recognized has somehow seeped itself into the walls and the structures and the heartbeats of the church. And suddenly church isn't about coming to church to learn something. It's about, well, how can someone serve me? How can that music be the music I like at the volume level that I like with people reacting in the way that I like? How can the church do something for me today. And we've started looking for preachers to teach us more about fashion trends than the truth. We've started wanting recognition more than we want transformation. We want to be found famous, not faithful, and we want excess, not excellence. And we find ourselves wanting our name and lights more than wanting the light. So church, What has happened to us? How did we let this need to be affirmed and celebrated and recognized come in the back doors of the church and take center stage? And as I thought about this in my own life, my own needs to be recognized, I realized that it it actually starts at a really young age. For me, Uh, There was a time in my life uh, in kindergarten, I was a ripe six-year-old looking for someone to affirm me, and the school gave me the most coveted award. It's called the Best Eater Award. (laughs) And I took that certificate with pride, and I got it the next year as well. Thank you very much. But something in my little heart gravitated toward that acknowledgement, that celebration, that certificate. And it sunk its claws deep in my heart and suddenly I was a child who wanted all the accolades and all the attention and all the platforms and all the awards. And if there was a competition, I'd put my name in the hat because I was gonna win that. And if there was a crown to wear, I was gonna get the crown. And if there was a chance to speak in front of people to get their eyes on me, I was gonna be the one to do it. And when I think about the church and I look around at all of us, it seems we all struggle with this. There are little nooks and crannies in our hearts that say, am I good enough? Am I measuring up? Does anyone see me? You know, we had an ice storm the other day and Weatherford just decided to basically shut down for a week. And uh, the parents were like, yay, one day off school, we can handle that. But by day four, we were all in dire need of Jesus. And my sweet daughter, Reese, approached me and said, mom, can we go up in the attic? I've never been up there. And you know, first day I was like, no, I'm not doing, that's a lot of work, I'm not doing that. Go play video games, right? But by the fourth day, I had no more excuses because <laughs> we've played all the games, we've done all the things. So I said, okay, let's go up in the attic. Let's check it out. And when we went up there, Reese found my containers of keepsakes. So I have one keepsake box that is all my mom's things, her letter from dancing in high school and letters she had from past boyfriends and and different things from when she was a mom and I was growing up. And and then I have a keepsake box of my own. And so Reese pulls the lid off that and she is pulling out certificate after award, after trophy, after pageant sash, after crown. And she was like, what's this one for? And what's this one for? And, and at first it was really fun. At first I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot about that thing. I forgot about the best eater award. I did not save that one. I should have though, because I feel like it should be framed on my wall. But the more she poured, pulled out awards, the less it was celebratory. And the more I started to think something was missing. All the things that had been said about me or over me when I was younger were contained in this box. And I thought, have I measured up to my potential? Am I somehow missing it? Certainly I have more to offer at 40 than I did at 14. And I wondered, have I given up my own personal following to follow Jesus? And is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? 
And so when I looked into God's word, I found the story of John the Baptist. And if there's ever a man in the Bible who understands what it's like to be overlooked, he's one of them. He's doing the hard work behind the scenes and doesn't get the acknowledgement. But here's what we know about John the Baptist. So John's mom was Elizabeth and Elizabeth was cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. So we know that God had a great plan for John before he was even born. So we find out that Mary is pregnant with Jesus and she goes immediately to visit her cousin Mary. And as they get close, John in his mother's womb reacts to the proximity of Jesus in the womb. I don't know about y'all, but when I was pregnant, the only movement I had was from greasy cheeseburgers. Like, right? We're not, we're not walking in the holiness of the Lord in those moments, but John was. John already had that anointing and that purpose even in the womb. John was also an OG pastor's kid, okay? So Zechariah was his dad and he was a priest. So his job was to help the people encounter God, right? His job was to get them to God. And so John grew up in a household that knew what it was like to serve the Lord. He probably bared some of the weight that my kids bear, which is everyone expects the pastor's kids to be a certain something or act a certain way. And so I'm sure that John identified with that at a really young age. But the thing that we also know about John the Baptist that's the most important is that he was a forerunner to Jesus. Everything about him was pointing the way to the Messiah coming. He said, it's not me, it's the Messiah. Don't look to me, look to the Messiah. And you know, guys, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, I know that it's tax season, not because I get my W-2s in the mail and, and not because the government requires that I turn in my taxes on time. It's that person that stands on the corner in the costume of Statue of Liberty, spinning the sign. And every time I go, oh, tax season, it's coming, right? They're the real, the real heroes, guys air guitar playing, that sign. Because now I know it's tax time. That was John the Baptist for Jesus. People saw him from afar and said, oh, I know exactly where he's pointing. I know exactly what's coming. I know what the plan is. And I may have forgotten and I may have been wrapped up in all the churchy things and I may have been wrapped up in myself. But when I look at John the Baptist, I remember what's to come. I remember what's important. And I know I started off reading in John chapter three about John the Baptist, but I wanna take a look at a different perspective of who he was. So I'm gonna to turn to John one, one through five. And John opens up his gospel with this description of Jesus. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. See, John wanted to paint a picture for us of who Jesus was to make sure that you understood that he was God, that he was the living word, that he wasn't an afterthought by God for our sin and, re and redemption, he was there from the very beginning. God was prepared with a solution for us from the very beginning and he sent that as Jesus in the flesh. And so as John opens the gospel that's about to tell you everything that Jesus ever did in his ministry, he starts with this, his divinity, his power, his authority. This was an earth shattering thing to say. And he wraps up after these first five verses and he takes a deep breath and he pins verse six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. See, every other gospel immediately identifies him as John the Baptist, but the book of John reminds you that he's just some guy. Nothing fancy, nothing impressive, just some guy named John. But he was hidden in the story of Christ and that's what made him important. And that's what made him have value because he knew that Christ was the whole reason he was even there. John, the author, was creating a chasm between the greatness of God and the lowliness of our humanity, but reminding us that in humility, we get to take part in the bigger story. So I've talked to you about John the Baptist and his humility, but there's another key player that has to do with the chiefs. 
and his name is Jerick the Kneeler. If you all watched the Super Bowl, you'll know what I'm talking about. I grew up in Kansas City. Uh, You know, I have been cheering for the Chiefs since I was really little. I bleed red and gold. It is how we eat and breathe and sleep in Kansas City. And that was when they were bad. So you can imagine the obsession now when they're really, really good, right? So we're watching the Super Bowl game. We're seeing it all play out. And some people were actually a little bit disappointed with the way that our win came about. There was no last minute Hail Mary throw by Patrick Mahomes to Travis Kelsey in this amazing run to get it in the end zone. What they literally did was gave the ball to Jarek McKinnon and they had him slide kneel to the one yard line and then they kicked a field goal. Some people said, are you kidding me? Why don't we do something amazing, something flashy, something impressive? A Facebook page said it this way, Jarek McKinnon could have spent the rest of his life telling his children and grandchildren about the time he scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. I'm sure he's dreamed of that moment since he was a child and he knows he may never get the opportunity again. Instead, with one minute left, he chose to sacrifice that accomplishment to better the chances that all of his teammates would get a ring. I will always be a fan and this picture should be put up in every high school gym in the country. Jarek chose the opposite of fame. He actually chose obscurity. He chose to be insignificant because he knew that the role he had to play was so much bigger than himself. And he might not be a believer. I don't know where he is with all of that, but I believe that he demonstrated the concept of becoming less so that others could become more. And this mentality mirrors the words of Jesus to his disciples. We see this in Matthew 16, 24, where he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So as Christians, our number one goal is to shine Jesus, to let go of all our needs, all our followers, all our platforms, all our affirmations and point to Jesus. And when we have seasons where we're hidden, when we have seasons where we wonder if we're measuring up, we wonder if anyone sees all the hard work we do, we have to be reminded that in our hiddenness, God cultivates our holiness. John the Baptist was in the wilderness before he ever started doing the work of Christ, of pointing to Christ, of baptizing. And there are times in our lives when we are hidden for a very specific purpose. Uh, And I think about when you are in the newborn stages with a baby, it's where you disappear for like four weeks in a row. And it's not just because you smell real bad because you haven't showered. Um, There's actually a purpose to it, right? You're learning your baby's patterns. You're learning when they sleep and when they're awake. You're learning, was this cry because they were sad or were they hungry? You're learning their mannerisms. You're learning their facial expressions. That time of hiddenness was training you to be a parent to a newborn that would someday grow up to be a five-year-old and need to be parented and be a 12-year-old that needs to be parented. It's a season of hiddenness that is training you for the next thing that's coming. And in that time, when I wondered as a new mom, specifically with Reagan, We had her, uh, we adopted her right as COVID hit. We literally could not leave our house to go anywhere for quite some time. And at that time I thought, gosh, I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this. This is really hard. And God said to me, then I hid you during a season for a reason. There is purpose for your hiddenness. There's purpose to obscurity. There's purpose to not having a platform, not having a voice, not being in front of people. There's a purpose because you're being trained for something else. And for some of you, it was those years you spent in college cranking out late night papers, right? Trying to get the degree that would get you to the job that you wanted. But if you didn't do the hard work of all the hours of study and reading, you wouldn't be able to do the job that he had called you to do. And for some of you, you were called to be on a platform or have an influence, but God had to create the character in you that was needed to sustain that. We've seen so many people who get fame too fast and too early and they fall hard. So stop looking at obscurity as an obstacle and see it as the gift that God has for you. It's a gift to create in you the heart that you need so that you can continue to point to Christ no matter what it is that you face. So I just wondered in my mind, I wonder if Jarek felt that way. I wonder if he knew what he was sacrificing in that moment when he decided to kneel and slide it to to the first, uh, first yard line. And here's what I found that he said. 
his thoughts. He said, we practice that slide every week. I didn't really think too much of it because that's just how we're coached. I didn't understand the magnitude of it until after it happened and I saw everyone's reaction. Jarek did what he was trained to do. Church, we have got to be trained in humility if we ever expect to see revival come. God will not give us platforms. He will not give us influence. He will not let us change the face of this world if we do not seek his face in humility. If we don't practice, if we don't practice, if we don't come to church on Sundays and learn God's word, if we don't get on our faces in the morning and pray, because it's in our repetition that God cultivates our right response. If we've practiced humility and we've practiced being hidden in Christ, when we do get a platform, when we do get a following, when we do get a voice at our job, when we do get a voice in the school district that we work in, it's going to be about Jesus and it's not going to be about you. But we've got to practice that. It's got to be so second nature that we don't weigh the options. Ooh, should I make this about me or should I make this about Jesus? Should I make this about my agenda or should I die to myself? If we are practicing the right repetitions, God's gonna do work in that and prepare us for the things that he has. And we know this because the Asbury revival that we all just experienced was a nameless, faceless movement. There's not one celebrity we can tag to that that caused it or kept it going. It was literally the Lord. And if y'all were here this weekend for If Gathering at our location, we couldn't live stream any of it. Not one woman in the room said, ah, oh, no, Jenny Allen, I'm out of here, right? He said, Erica Willis, oh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but we were able to plug in those spaces with nameless, faceless women who serve our church. And every room, woman that was in the room was ready to receive because they didn't make it about the big name that was attached to it. So we see glimpses of goodness in our church. We see glimpses of where we're starting to get it. We see where we're starting to cultivate humility. So how do we continue that? How do we keep looking for the reflection of Christ in the mirror instead of our own reflection? It's gonna take work, church. It doesn't come naturally. Naturally, our flesh says, acknowledge me, give me attention, look at me. So it's gonna take some work. The first thing we need to do is be humble in Christ. Easier said than done, right? Luke 14, 11 says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And for those who humble themselves, they'll be exalted. Humble for here in the Greek is tapenao, which means to make low or bring low. So it's the make low versus bring low. I can make myself humble or God can bring me low on his own terms. Have y'all ever um, been super humiliated in front of a lot of people? You're t you are so humiliated, you won't even raise your hands now. Well, I'm gonna share with you one of the most embarrassing moments of my life, so just hang on. So uh, like I said, I was always going for the award. I was always trying to win the thing. And so after, uh, after high school to make money for college, I was doing beauty pageants. And I had won a crown and I, was, I had shown up for a pageant or a, for a parade. So you guys have seen it before. You get in a fancy car and the girl's in a dress with the crown so you can imagine all the things. And I'm gonna wave to my people, wave to my followers, all the people that were there, right? So I put on my crown and I'm all ready to go and we're in my mom's Mustang um, and she's driving me and she's been driving like two miles an hour for like 30 minutes, right? And her foot is starting to cramp and her foot slips off and the car comes to a sudden jerking halt which propels me from the back of the car through to the front two seats on my face. And I can hear the audible laughter of everyone on the side of the parade route. My brother's the loudest, I might add. <laughs> and so I, I contemplated just staying there and having my mom drive off the route. Just, just get me out of here. But instead... I gathered my courage and I stood up and I took a bow to both sides of the car. And then I sat back and I waved her on and I played it off as if it was not embarrassing at all. And then I peed my pants. No, I really didn't pee my pants. I really, that was, that was a joke. It really wasn't that bad. But here's the deal. I don't know if I was full of pride in that moment or not, but the Lord can be creative in the ways that he brings humility to you. We've got to choose humility, y'all. We have to choose it. We have to step into it. We have to create space for it. When there's an opportunity for someone else to shine, we don't say, oh, you're my competition. We say, shine, shine. The second thing we need to do is to do the work of Christ. 
John the Baptist did the work of Christ. He's like a crazy guy in the wilderness. He's wearing animal fur. He's eating locusts and honey. He is like a crazy man. But he did exactly what the Lord asked him to do. And then he did the hard work every single day of dying to self and pointing to Jesus and baptizing people and saying, look to the Messiah, look to the Messiah, look to the Messiah. What you do doesn't have to be impressive to be impactful. Changing diapers in the middle of the night is not impressive, but it's impactful. Praying with a friend who's walking through a really hard time is not impressive, but it's impactful. Praying when nobody else is watching and no one will know about it because you're not gonna post about it on any kind of social media is not impressive, but it's impactful. And don't let the enemy allow you to compare to other people. It will always lead to discontentment. And we saw that in the opening chapter in John, in chapter three, where even John the Baptist's followers are like, do you see that guy over there? Everybody's going to him. Nobody's coming to you. That's not fair, right? They're comparing him to Jesus himself. So we know if that scenario, they're gonna compare to Jesus. You know the enemy is gonna do that with you as well. Oh, you have a following? That person has 20,000 followers. Oh, you think you're making an impact in the school? Look at that teacher. They're teacher of the year. You should probably get an award like that, right? We start to compare and then discontentment comes in. And we've got to remember that our job is to point to Jesus, not to ourselves. And the third is to point in the direction of Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So whether you're on a platform or behind the scenes, you've got to be prepared to point to Jesus in all seasons. And it's not fake humility. Fake humility is like, oh, not me. It's all the Lord. The Lord did it. I had no part. It's acknowledging what you have done in the power and strength of the Lord and saying, even in that, he still gets the glory. Even in the hard work, thank you for acknowledging it, but it's, he gets the glory. It's his purposes. It's his ways. He's the reason we're here. Church, it's time to flip the switch. It's time to flip the script. It's time for us to realize that it's not about us. Truly, and really, really believe it deep down inside. It's about Christ. It's about what he can do. And if we want true revival to happen, we've got to get to a place where we confess our pride. We get on our faces and say, Lord, not my will, but your will. You must become greater, I must become less. My name won't go down in history, God, but yours will. And another 2,000 years from now, no one will know who Erica Willis was, but they'll know who Jesus was. And they'll be able to point back to Hudson Oaks and say, there was a church that made a difference. They didn't play games. They didn't say they loved Jesus and then act as if the world revolved around them. They actually just loved Jesus. And they did the hard thing and they served and they loved and they prayed and they worshiped like it actually meant something to them. So I'm gonna have a stand today. I wanna invite you into a time of allowing the Lord to begin to reveal some places in your heart where maybe the enemy has been allowed to sneak in the back door and convince you that it's about you. I wanna give you space to repent of those thoughts, those actions, even the ones you did not even realize you were making that pointed to you instead of Christ. I'm gonna call our prayer team down because if you're feeling these things, we always wanna partner with you. Not because we fix you, but because we wanna fight the battle with you. You're never alone, no matter what you face and your struggles and your faith, we are here for you and we wanna partner with you. So if you need to come forward for repentance or just to realign maybe your expectations, maybe to tell God you're sorry that you've compared yourself to everyone else's walk. Maybe you've looked back at times in your life when you thought, man, I had that scholarship to go play for that team in college, but I guess I wasn't good enough. I guess nobody cared enough. I guess I don't have purpose now. Maybe you were up for the big promotion that somebody else got and you turned to God and said, I need, I need some attention here, God. Maybe speaking to you about some of that, but for some of you, God's also said it's a time of uncovering. Some of you have been in obscurity. You've been in hiddenness. You've been walking in humility. And the Lord has been calling you out of that season, but you're terrified that you'll step into pride. 
Today is the day that you get to trust Him with your purposes, with your plan, and the timing of when He puts you on a platform. So I'm gonna invite you to come forward as we sing. If you wanna receive prayer, if there's anything else on your heart you'd like prayer for, come forward, don't hesitate. Let's invite the Lord into this space for conviction.